I've committed the cardinal sin of drinking Mountain Dew before recording this, but we're just gonna <laughs> ignore that. So this is my first video that I'm uploading to my channel, and because of that, because I refuse to make an introduction video because I psyched myself out about it, I need to preface this by saying that I do not plan on being a Wizards 101 content creator. This is a one-off video because I had an intrusive thought that I needed to turn into a concept, that I needed to turn into a thing, and that's what we're here for. So don't pin me into a box, please and thank you. I plan on making a lot of random stuff. And if you like it, I appreciate it. And if you don't, that's fine too. Okay. Did you ever have a game growing up that you played that just really made you feel immersed? Something that you just look back on and think, yeah, my childhood could have been very different without this. To me, that was Wizards 101. For as janky and polygon dependent as it was and still kind of is, this game had a lot of cute charm and fun to it, from the different puns and creative wordplay of characters and places, to the silly moments and the deep for a ten-year-old main plot and surprising social commentary. For example, the obvious correlation between the Marlebonians and the British and their habits of taking treasures from other cultures, incorporating them into their museums, etc, etc, on top of the obvious correlation between the Crocs enslaving the Manders in Crocotopia reflecting how the Egyptians enslaved the Jewish uh, in ancient times. Like, if that was not intentional social commentary, I would be very surprised. So, yeah, there is a lot to love about this game, and there's also a lot to not love about this game. Uh, the paywall just starts way too early. It starts in the first world. You only get, like, three areas unlocked and everything else is stuck behind a paywall and they have like 17 worlds open i feel like they should at least unlock the other towns in wizard city for new players uh on top of that just like the paylock behind a lot of cool items a lot of good inventory organization this is not a game review <laughs> this is not a game review <laughs> what this is is a game pitch so, what if Wizards 101 was a tabletop role-playing game? Think about it. So the game system, almost perfectly formulated to be a sufficiently translatable TTRPG. The card-playing system as a main core gameplay component, the massive collections of worlds and characters and ready-made maps are perfect for a tabletop game. And because it wouldn't be locked into server and program limitations, you could create more class systems and game masters would have more control over what story they wanted to tell. If this sounds cool to you, uh, then come with me on the cyber fixative journey my brain has been on for the last two weeks as I break this down for you play by play. We'll be going over how to convert this online game onto the table or a digital table, how the battle system will work, additional classes, equipment, role playing, and even player versus player options. So let's start with the core gameplay system. How is this going to work? Well, similar to D&D, I would use a dice system. Currently, I plan only to use two dice, a d20 and a 1d6 die. The d20 would be used to determine if a spell fizzles or if a physical attack hits. So a 1 through a 4 would be a fizzle, a 5 through a 15 would be a success, and a 16 through 20 would be a critical hit success. The 1d6 would determine additional damage on a critical hit. So you would multiply the total damage of the card by the number rolled on the 1d6. As for the physical attack aspect that I mentioned, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but for now stay focused with me. I conduct this train of thought, not efficiently, but I try! <laughs> so. Back to the die. Uh, since I have established how they'll work in battle, let's talk about role-playing and out-of-battle situations. Your character will have eight stat skills to help them in other situations. You have stealth, charisma, brute strength, common sense, spirit sense, dexterity, and knowledge. Stealth will be used obviously, like you want to be stealthy, you want to steal something, or you want to attack somebody from behind. Charisma also works as seduction. It's how charismatic you are, how influential you are. Brute strength, very obvious. You're going to be hitting, punching, and all of that. Maybe moving objects. Common sense is a skill that I am mostly associating with like the type of wizard who comes to Wizard City as a human being. And they bring with them, like, why don't you just Google it type of stuff. <laughs> 
Uh, the spirit sense is specifically to like necromatic things, uh, communicating with spirits of the dead, all of that. Uh, and then dexterity and knowledge is like flexibility, ability to uh, react to situations quickly, and then, you know, knowledge, knowing things, researching things, all of that. Characters will roll on success rates by the d20 using the same metric. A 1 through a 4 will be a fail, a 5 through a 15 is a success, and a 16 through 20 is a critical success. Characters will also have buffs and debuffs to these skills based off of their class, their species, their equipment, and other factors. Like, if you decide to play a character who is innately uncharismatic or just dumb as a brick, just to add some spice to your gameplay, for example, that could be a thing if you wanted it to be. So, yeah. Now that I've walked you through the dice system, let's talk about the battle systems. The magic system of battle will work almost exactly the same, just physical. The players will have a deck of cards and have a hand of seven cards to play at a time. Um, again, it's going to be almost identical to the point where I have made a mock-up board for players to put their miniatures, or if you're the type of player who doesn't want miniatures, you can use game pieces representing your characters. I'm imagining this is like a board game you would purchase similar to like Magic the Gathering or something. But anyways, uh, players will go one at a time and play their cards against the enemies with buffs, debuffs, wards, shields, hexes, all of that in play. Players and the game master will need to keep track of the hit points as well as their how the wards and the shields and the hexes affect the spell accuracy and power, similar to D&D, so there will be some level of math involved. Uh, however, the tabletop game will incorporate a new fighting element, which is physical attacks. So if your wizard casts a spell that casts themselves into the playing field physically, uh, like some of the wand class spells in the game do, not only will the spell's magical damage affect the enemy, but physical damage will be in play as well. Uh, in a moment, I'll discuss some of the new class systems to help explain this new physical attack system, but basically, let's say your player doesn't want to be a wizard, or they are outside of that magic circle, all of the spots are filled, you're playing with more than four people at a time. Depending on their class or subclass or their skills, they can attack the enemies from outside of that circle. However, outside enemies can do the same to you if they choose to, so watch out for that. So, yeah, we gotta make it fair for the game master as well. <laughs> Now that we've discussed the magical fighting system, let's talk about the non-magical fighting system. Players will roll their dice for physical attacks. Any physical buffs and debuffs characters have by means of their species, class, or equipment will be added to these matches. If the character is using a magic-infused weapon, magical buffs and debuffs will be added. So if your player has a character wielding fire gauntlets, for example, they could do both the physical damage and a smaller fire magic attack that could assist in that fight. Other, like Another implementation is summons. For example, if you're a death student, you can summon a skeletal warrior or a ghoul to fight alongside you. If you choose to, you can summon these mi minions out of magical based battle to fight physically alongside you. They would have a set base of hit points based on how much mana you choose to use for the spell along with how hard they hit. So if you spent 20 mana points to summon a minion they would have 400 hit points and plus 22 brute strength when attacking. Basically 200 hit points and 10 plus strength for every 10 points of mana spent. Kind of might seem a little confusing and complicated, but by standards of tabletop role-playing games, this is simple enough. While this game will have some level of math, I'll be transparent in saying that math is also not my strongest skill set, so I won't be including anything more complicated than basic multiplication in this game. So now that we've gotten that out of the way and have discussed the basic fighting system, let's talk about the class system, which is the part that I am very excited about. So we're going to start with the wizard class. If you've already played the game, then you're already familiar with this class. You are a practitioner of magic, you fight primarily using your spells and typically with a wand. Maybe you're a myth student who sees the world as your canvas, or maybe you're a death student with a pink pop star persona. It's a role playing game, so even if you pick a specific school that doesn't mean that that has to define who your character is, I just want to put that out there real quick. Uh, also, I like having an excuse to draw all these little pictures and characters because I think it's fun. So, you pick a school and that's what you play as for the rest of the game. I plan on tweaking this formula just a little bit to be more player friendly, both for gameplay and role playing purposes. So the different classes you can choose from are Fire, Ice, Storm, Myth, Life, Death, and Balance. 
However, there are also the celestial schools of magic that I plan on including as early as the start of the game, being Sun, Moon, and Star. In the MMO, the system would be that you would learn the school's spells primarily for free as you level up, and you can learn additional spells using training points. However, you would need to know all of the lower class spells of that school before getting to the one at your level, spending all of your training points on useless spells just to get the dumb myth frog. This is a dumb system and I hate it. Uh, <laughs> So in the tabletop system, training points will still be a part of the game, but instead of only getting a few for each story arc you clear, they would be rewards that the game master would give to the players for various things, like solving a problem uniquely, reaching a specific level. Maybe they talked to the NPC that the game master put a lot of energy into and they were like, just thank you for talking to my pet. <laughs> So yeah, uh, you would also wouldn't need to learn every single lower level spell just to get to the spell that you want to learn. You still have to learn spells within your level, like you can't learn a level 50 spell at level 5, uh, but you would not need to learn every single spell in that school in order to get to that higher level spell, because that's an annoying system. And I think that having a student go to a wizard school and forcing them to only learn one subject and not all of the subjects that are readily available is just... It's, it's a waste. It, it makes sense for an MMO where they want you to spend more money, but in a tabletop room, it's just a waste. So, uh, in short, Sun, Moon, and Star Schools are available immediately. A uh, more rewarding training point system will be implemented, and you do not have to carry around a bunch of lower level spells you do not need. Also, this is a minor fix, but it needs to be done. Uh, but since the success rates of fizzles are now dice based rather than card based, life magic is going to get a buff and attacks will be as strong as death magic while storm will take a slight debuff and be as strong as ice and fire magic. This way the gameplay is more balanced and if somebody wants to live their leaf green cottage core aesthetic dream through the character, they don't have to take a debuff just to do so. Stop making systems that punish healer classes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Justice for life students, okay? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so the next class that I have developed is the warrior class. Warriors fight physically with weapons or their bodies. They can be played in any way. Maybe you're a traditional barbarian wielding an axe or a hammer. Maybe you're a construction worker who fights with a steel beam and a jackhammer. Or maybe you're a ninja pig, like from the game. Like, this is a role-playing game. You can be as creative with this concept as you want to. Uh, then there's also minions and constructions, and as previously discussed, wizards can summon minions outside of magic battles to assist in physical altercations, and you know, I think there should- I don't think there should be any reason that a player wouldn't want to play a minion role if they wanted to. Like, let's say you have a friend who wants to play this tabletop game with you, but they can't attend every game night consistently, they have a busy personal life, giving them a role like this, they can still fill it to play the game, they can still roleplay with everyone, but their app just doesn't disrupt the flow of the game, if that makes sense. Like, if they're just not there that day, it's just, oh, the, the spell ran out, uh, so we'll summon him another time or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, that's my idea for the warrior class. The next class I'm very excited about uh, is the warlock class. Now, I think that technically anyone could subclass as a warlock or dual class essentially. So here's the concept. Warlocks are similar to wizards, but they pull their powers from another source. Giving their powers from nature, forces of magic, the old titans, or even someone or something smaller like a fire elf giving them flaming arrows and magic items or something like that. They get spells in tandem with the agreements that they make with these creatures or forces regardless of any school or by doing them favors. So you could get a Kraken spell from the Storm School for being a weaken, like a wingman for the Triton Avenue Kraken because he's trying to go on a date with someone, <laughs> I don't know. You could get a Skeletal Pirate uh, summon for helping a Skeletal Pirate get his femur back from a Marley Bonian. <laughs> Uh, or it could be a bigger thing like getting exclusively fire spells from a continued agreement with a fire titan, something like that. Basically where wizards learn spells by studying their related element and getting an understanding on it, warlocks earn it through non-conventional means and favors. So anyone could have a warlock-like pact through a favor as an extra spell to help them out and it opens up more fun avenues for roleplaying and improvising scenes. 
Can you tell I was a theater kid yet? Can you tell? I know I'm annoying. <laughs> Anyways, that's the class system. I also want to implement a subsystem. Uh, as there were many different subsystems in the original MMO, like crafting and fishing, uh, and this has some appeal for some of the players of the original game, so to incorporate these aspects into the tabletop game, if your players want to have them there, I have simplified some of these things into three community courses that anyone can learn regardless of class. They are alchemy, botany, and zoology. So alchemy, We'll combine all aspects of potion making, reagent hunting, regent hunting, I can't pronounce that word, I'm sorry. Uh, this community course will be taught by the balanced professor in Wizard City, is what I've decided. You can change that as the game master if you want to. Um, so if you want to make or learn how to make potions, make or upgrade equipment, treasure cards, that sort of thing, this is what that course would be. In game, the school would supply common reagents and crafting stations, similar to how school laboratories work for science experiments. However, if you like defeated an extra hard boss or you find a very rare reagent, this could be used to upgrade equipment in specific ways. That way, if you have players who enjoy the collecting aspect of the game, uh, this is something that you can implement for that type of collectathon player. Next on to botany, this is a gardening specific aspect of the game. So growing plants would be extended to being able to communicate with plant-based sentient creatures, manipulating, growing, and killing off plants in the area, that sort of thing. This course would more than likely come into play in role-playing, dialogue heavy scenarios with plants, uh, or in dungeon puzzle based areas where plants could grow. It's a passive skill that would be more into play in those sort of subtle ways. Zoology would combine all things fishing and pet related, along with monstrology. You can make pet snacks, fishes, uh, like, uh, you can't make fish, you can fish, okay? Uh, you can make the fish your pets and you can fish. Uh, you can communicate and talk to your pets. I was gonna edit that out, I think it's funny, I'm gonna leave it in. Uh, instead of fighting a monster over and over again with a monstrology card cast, uh, to try and get like that monster, you would have just a heightened chance of making amends and friendship with a more animal-like enemy, and you might even be able to enlist their help later on due to your deeper understanding and relationship with them. So it's somewhat like the Warlock Connection, but instead of it being a spell cast summon, it's more like a, I've made a relationship with this NPC, can we call on them now, sort of thing. Also, on the note of fishing, because the fishing system and the MMO was incredibly frustrating, obviously it works differently now. So, uh, to fish, you roll your 1d6 to determine what you get, but you always fish something up. So, a 1 to a 2 would be a common fish, a 3 to a 4 would be a rare fish, and a 5 to a 6 would be a treasure chest or a rare item. Uh, it's something that would more than likely come into play while other players are shopping or talking to NPCs, something to do in those peaceful, domestic role-playing moments, basically. Now on to the next topic, which is the topic of species. I think it's more fun to have players have more options to play characters outside of just the 10-year-old human child that you are in the MMO. Um, like, what's to stop you from playing a croc or a mantra or a raven? I think that if players want to, they should be able to. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, there's a lot of social commentary on the cultures around these areas where these species characters are located. Uh, and so I would just leave that up to the game master if they want to incorporate those aspects or not. But we've already talked about that in story ways and story should be written and decided by the game master. So we're just going to talk about like the different species uh, and how I have determined like how to codify them basically. So I have based kind of like their weaknesses, their strengths, and abilities on the animals they are based off of. I've not done this for every single species in the Wizards 101 game because one, I only played to Celestia, and two, there's so many, so I'm just gonna give some basic examples. So I'm gonna start with the Manders because they're some of my favorite NPCs. I love their designs. I think they're so cute, um, but they're based off of Salamanders. Obviously why I love them. I love Salamanders. Um, so Salamanders can have lungs, gills or neither they can breathe through their skin which is a very unique ability so i think that if somebody wanted to play a mander character they could play one that plays primarily underwater 
uh, or one that can go days without opening their mouth for whatever reason. Maybe if you're playing a croc, you have a high defense stat against stealth attacks specifically from behind due to the fact that crocodiles have like the bone plating on their backs. Uh, stuff like that. I, I'm basing uh, their strengths and weaknesses and abilities off of just what animal they seem to be related to. Um, also in the MMO, you can have pets for also the same species as the overworld NPCs, which is weird. So uh, my fix to this is that if you have a pet mander uh, and were to compare it to a person mander, that would be the equivalent of comparing a human to a monkey. They aren't on the same level intellectually, and to imply that a mander person and a mander pet are on the same level would be like calling a monkey your uncle. <laughs> but yeah, animal based stats, I don't have all of them fleshed out for gameplay, uh, but most of them will be related to magical and physical buffs and debuffs for the combat system through, uh, like, uh, yeah, some of them might just be silly though. Like, if you're playing a Marley, Bony, and Dog, maybe you get a negative 5 to vacuum cleaners. If you're playing a cat, maybe you get a negative 10 to catnip, that sort of thing. Uh, if you decided to play a human character, I would say that uh, you would not take any buffs or debuffs based off of your species. It would be a true neutral species. Uh, probably best for beginners who don't want to do as much math, adding and subtracting to uh, how that would affect their gameplay. Uh, some species are very human-like, such as the Cyclops or the Gulls, so those stats would be based on their more obvious traits, like uh, Cyclopes probably have a high brute strength stat based off of their physical designs in the game, while Gulls would more than likely have a high spirit set stat. So something like that. So with that established, let's move on to equipment. There's so much equipment and different combinations and options in the game that it would be horrible to try and keep track of all of that in a one-person ran tabletop. So the system will instead be built around six core equipment types that will increase skill stats based on what bases the player want covered in relation to their level in the game. The first one is robes. Robes will encompass what would be the clothing in the video game. So hats, robes, shoes, and accessories that are visual. Robes will give general stat buffs, like plus three per level, and increase total hit points plus five per level. One like once a character hits level 30, the rare robe drops can result in an additional card to the deck. Uh, Thames are blades that characters don't physically wield in the game, they're attachments. Uh, in real life, Thames were used at times as a symbol of status, power, or military position in some cultures in the past, so that's what a Thames will act as in the game similarly. They can boost one of your character's skill stats, like charisma or knowledge for example, plus two per level, and some of Thames will give your character respect or recognition in certain so social circles, or do the exact opposite, depending on how you got the Athame or where you got it from. So it could have some level of uh, role-playing influence. The next one is amulets. Amulets in the game are used to give wizards one additional card typically. Uh, in this RPG, the amulet will not only cover this, but also what rings would normally cover in the game as well. So you can get one additional card equal to your current level, as well as a plus five hit point per level. Wands, um, these give an equivalent spell to the caster's level, they can cast physical spells or basic spells. Next is armor. Armor works similar to work, uh, robes, increasing plus 5 hit points per level, but they also provide defensive buffs against specific attacks, plus 3 per level. So one set of armor could protect you against ice spells, while another could protect you against death spells. You can wear your armor and your robes, cause yeah, uh, don't wear armor naked, that's a bad idea <laughs> in real life. <laughs> so the final one is weapons. Uh, weapons work as a physical attack piece of equipment, they increase the wielder's brute strength stat by 5 plus each level. Some weapons may have a magical aspect of sort, as discussed earlier, so adding an additional magical buff. So let's say your character was level 15 and they were wielding, again, the fire gauntlets. I love them. So that would be their base strength stat plus 75 points of damage for the physical attack because they're level 15, uh, and plus 10 to the fire. That plus 10 fire might be plus 15 if the enemy is weak to fire, or only plus 5 if they are strong against it. Finally, I think the biggest gameplay appeal 
uh, to Wizards 101 for a lot of people is the player versus player system, and I don't see why that can't be implemented here too. So if you wanted to use the cards and the board pieces like the traditional game, you could, or you could do a PvP among your campaign players, and it would be just a lot of fun for a lot of people. You could even do a royale where you take each other's cards, you shuffle them into one huge deck, and deal them out like a card game and play in a randomized sort of way. Or you could play the game tradition. It would be up to you. Um, but I do want to make sure that that PvP element is still intact. I was never into PvP, but I know a lot of people are. So I think that's an important element to keep intact. Ultimately, I have a lot of nostalgia for this game. It is so fun, and it is so cute, and I think it should be more accessible to people. Uh, which is why I've made a semi-playable version of this very idea. So I will link the available assets and things below for people to use, and a dice rolling app for people who don't own any of their own dice, like me. I'm, I don't either, so uh, I'll see if I can make a, def, uh, a deck shuffling system as well. Uh, there will be downloadable printable PDFs of character sheets, maps, and cards provided from the Wizards 101 website. I am releasing this under Creative Commons with non-commercial licensing, so if King's Isle decides that they want to buy this idea from me because they think it's profitable, I'm open to that discussion. Um, but otherwise, I don't feel comfortable profiting off of a fan-made product, so this will be publicly available for free until the company buys it from me, I guess. <laughs> so. Uh, thanks for watching with Faves. I'll see you another time. Bye-bye.